Are there common beliefs that most Christians believe that are rarely challenged but are 100% in line with ufology? Beliefs that will cause the most sincere Christian to question their understanding of truth? Yes. And I'm going to explain that in this video. My name is Bradley Burnham and I talk about the stranger things that happen in your normal life to give you a biblical understanding of, of what's going on. So hit that subscribe button because we got a lot to cover and you ain't seen nothing yet. Some of the most popular ufologists, talking head personalities, and entertainment stars that are advancing spiritualism of today is Stephen Greer, George Knapp, and George Norrie. That I never saw, thought I would see in my lifetime, all these years of chasing this crazy mystery, that it's a legitimate uh, subject of inquiry. What are some of the most interesting beliefs and experiences that has led them down this path? In a radio interview, George Knapp listens to a story from one of his guests where he recounts one of his own experiences. My sister and I went and moved in with my grandparents, and uh, my grandmother died sort of halfway through that period. What appeared to have happened uh, after my grandmother died is that she returned to the house um, to, um, I suppose classically, one might say haunted, but because it's so sort of personal, I'm reluctant to use that word. But anyway, she was, her presence was felt in the house. Well, I have something remarkably similar in my own background that I have never shared. I'll share it with you at some point, maybe in a pub or over a cup of coffee someday. Uh, but my father, what he shared with me about the death of his mother, my grandmother, in a big old rambling house, and she came back as well. And I'm sure, uh, you know, I've never written about it or spoken about it, but I'm sure that it left an Im impression that probably affected uh, directions for my journalism as well uh, as it did with you. Isn't it interesting that Knapp says this shaped his career? A belief that is held so close by so many Christians is called, by the guest, a haunting. Probably because the ones that are haunting are not loved ones, but instead demonic spirits. And how do we know it's true that it wasn't Nori's family that came back to haunt him? Well, the Bible tells us in Job 7, 9-10. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house nor shall his place know him anymore. Then there's Stephen Greer, who is probably the most well-known doctor turned UFOologist and who made it his career to teach others how to communicate with these seemingly benevolent spirits. Long story short, I had a near-death experience one night where I literally left my body and because I wasn't raised in a religious tradition where you go to this angry, angry gray-haired man throwing bolts down from, I went into the depths of outer space. And um, I had a, an extraordinary metaphysical experience which defied everything I was raised to believe um, with a God-type experience, God-consciousness experience. And I went into a state of consciousness where there was this connection with these beings. Eventually, these two enlightened beings, these sort of twin, powerful, almost like avatar type beings, said, well, you may come with us or go back to Earth. And I said, well, I had enough presence of mind to say, well, what is your will? I mean, what should I do? And I'm a 17-year-old boy who was raised as totally an atheist. We were Unitarians, but we didn't believe in anything. And <laughs> they said, well, we would uh, like for you to go back to, to Earth, to, to work on what you can do for Earth. I then became very interested in exploring higher states of consciousness. Isn't it interesting that when he says he almost died, he didn't go straight to heaven or hell or some other purgatory location. He met an avatar being who asked him to go back to Earth and this is what led him to start exploring and the communication between mnemonic spirits typically called aliens. In fact, he says that this demonic near-death experience also led him to develop these CE5 protocols which they gave him, which is the type of Eastern meditation that allows him and others to communicate with these demonic spirits that are impersonating extraterrestrials. If this experience came from God, it shouldn't have pushed him to communicate with demonic spirits. 
Hi, I'm George Norrie, host of Coast to Coast AM, the national radio show, and Beyond Belief, our streaming television program. And I just had a great opportunity of interviewing Gail Rubin, the expert on dying. We talked about funerals and cremations and just preparing for what to do when you join the other side. Even George Norrie uses the words join the other side to describe death. All these UFO researchers believe that the dead do not actually ever die. So why is this important? Because what you believe about the dead can open up the door for future influence, just as we saw happen to Nap. As we read about the story of Israel in the Bible, the Bible gradually expounds on the story of speaking to the spirits that impersonate the dead. While Israel was staying in Shittim, the men began to indulge in sexual immorality with Moabite women, who invited them to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Peor, and the Lord's anger burned against them. They joined themselves also to Baal of Peor, and ate sacrifices made to the dead. Okay, so their gods were the dead. Worshipping the dead is necromancy, which is forbidden by God. Let's continue reading. Rather that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice they sacrifice to demons and not to God, and I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. So the sacrifices of the dead were actually sacrifices to demons impersonating dead people which seemed like gods to them, or they had some extra power to them after they died. Seem familiar? It should, because this is exactly what happened to Saul in the Bible. In the story of the witch of Endor, Saul was very concerned about a war with the Philistines. Since he could not get an answer from God, he turned to witches to call upon demons to speak to the dead. Let's read it. Saul said, please conduct a seance for me and bring up for me the one who I shall name for you. Then the woman said, who shall I bring up for you? He said, bring up Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice and the woman spoke to Saul saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is its form? And she said, an old man is coming out and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Here's five reasons why we know the witch did not bring back Samuel. Number one, it was not the Lord that helped him. First Chronicles 10, 13 through 14 says, So Saul died for his unfaithfulness, which he had committed against God, because he did not keep the word of the Lord, and also because he had consulted a medium for guidance. But he did not inquire to the Lord, therefore he killed him, and turned the king over to David, son of Jesse. So there you go, it says it right there. Saul was not inquiring of the Lord at this point, and if he wasn't inquiring of the Lord, he must have been inquiring of the devil. Number two, only the witch saw the spirit. The witch herself said, a spirit is ascending out of the earth, not Saul, but a spirit. And later on, it says that Saul perceived it was Samuel. Number three, God did not respond to him. So why would he respond and bring up Samuel? God's hand is not forced by a witch. Number four, Saul is not killed by the Philistines taking his life. He took his own life, which makes the prophecy false. The devil's spirits are very good at guessing. They calculate the future, but they can't know the future. Only God knows the future and is 100% accurate all the time. If he's not correct, it's not of God. Since the prophecy was wrong, the only other answer for spirits appearing was the devil. Number five, the devil cannot bring anyone back from the dead. Since we know it was not God that brought them back, it has to be the devil. And the devil is fantastic at impersonating any form of person he chooses. They've had a lifetime to perfect it. Remarkably, the Bible says in Revelation that these same deceptions will happen at the end of time. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. The work of dealing with these familiar spirits was pronounced an abomination to the Lord, and it was solemnly forbidden under penalty of death. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits. Do not seek after them, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. A man or a woman who is a medium, or who has familiar spirits, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them, 
and those that practice speaking to the dead were banned from Israel, even unto death. And even today, we have mediums that say they can talk to the dead, and Christians that attend these things and believe these things, although God forbids it. When I was asked to do a profile of arguably the world's most renowned psychic medium, I accepted. No, I didn't believe we could talk to our dead loved ones. But then again, who wouldn't want it to be true? Divine Heavenly Parent, we ask your blessing upon this meeting today. Dear spirit friends, please draw near to me. Give us glimpses of eternity. So if God bans this activity, who or what is this guy praying to? One person that knows the most about worshiping demons is Roger Murnau, who was once a part of a demon worshiping cult taught by a satanic priest that openly told him they were worshiping Lucifer. After Murnau was rescued by a coworker, he revealed what he learned. What is Christian idolatry? The priest mentioned that word. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us what he said, Roger. He said that Christian idolatry is the most grandiose deception that has ever been brought up upon the uh, human family upon mankind and he says in any Boston that demon spirits are continually defiling Christian churches through the avenue of necromancy by using a form of spirit worship that involves hundreds of millions of Christians into idolatry without their being aware of it the priest says that the su this super deception is brought about in only one way through the deceptive belief that man has an immortal soul that lives on after death and he said that constitutes idolatry, idolatry through necromancy. So he says there are hundreds of millions of Christians that are practicing idolatry while they think they're glorifying God. <laughs> See? Because they, they believe? People believe that the dead have entered into a higher state of existence than they had when they were alive. Also that they are in a position and have the capacity to help the living here on earth. Now, the priest explained that when people believe in uh, this business, they are actually opening themselves to be completely deceived by demon spirits because it gives the demon spirits an opportunity to impersonate the dead. When a person believes that they are in contact with a former dead relative, they are easily influenced and guided by that being instead of by God. This is called idolatry. This influence is exactly what happened to George Knapp and will happen much more once this spiritual demonic deception breaks upon the world in the form of extraterrestrials. Sadly, this undying soul myth has crept into Christian churches perpetuated by Hollywood media that continues to push the idea that the dead are not truly dead and that there is some living spirit or conscious soul that lives on to help them. I thought you might turn up. But the Bible simply does not teach this idea. However, this idea that man has an immortal soul is in fact a teaching of the LeVay Satanic Bible. It is this lust for life which will allow the vital person to live on after the inevitable death of his fleshy shell. So what do we make of these emotional stories about people that have seen heaven? Well, this is called heavenly tourism. Let's check into some of these stories. The boy who was the inspiration behind the best-selling book, The Boy Who Came Back From Heaven, admits he made the whole thing up. Alex Malarkey is now 16, but 10 years ago, when he was six years old, he was in a car crash that left him in a coma for two months. When he woke up, he found out he was paralyzed and told his parents and doctors an amazing story, saying he was lifted up to heaven by an angel where he met Jesus and Satan. The story apparently sounded so plausible and inspirational that it was made into the best-selling book, which was co-authored by his father, Kevin. Published in 2010, the publishers now say they will be pulling the book from the shelves, but Alex said he made the whole thing up in an attempt to attract attention after his crazy ordeal. In fact, if we go through most prominent figures in heavenly tourism, we can see that their stories don't even match. They're not consistent between other heavenly tour guides. The four most prominent figures is Don Piper, Colin Burpo, Jesse Duplantis, and Mary Baxter. Don Piper says there is no wings on angels and they have no age. Colton Burpo says they have wings and they're in the late 20s. Jesse Duplantis says they saw babies, while Mary Baxter says that the babies were all grown up. 
there are other contradictions even within their own testimonies. So what truly happens after death then? Well, we actually have some data on that now. This next clip is from a nurse that explains how they got new data showing exactly what happens right when someone dies. Doctors in Estonia were performing a routine brain scan on a very elderly patient in 2016. When the brain scan was being performed, the patient had a fatal heart attack and died on the table. Thus, the doctors managed to accidentally capture the brain scan of a dying human being for the first time. They captured a total of 900 seconds of brain activity in that scan and they were specifically able to see changes 30 seconds before and after the patient's heart stopped beating. The findings were kinda surprising. For about a minute, 30 seconds before his heart stopped and for 30 seconds after, the brain scans were very very similar to what they're like during memory recall, meditation and dreaming. So turns out it is actually quite likely true that people see their life flash before their eyes when they die. When the brain is deprived of oxygen, like when a person dies, cells go through a brief period of extreme activity which can generate patterns in brain signals. This was the first complete finding so far and it has indicated that people were in fact remembering things just before they died. So if people were remembering things before they died, they certainly didn't go straight to heaven or hell. In fact, some people were brought back and they recall the state of mind that they were in just before they died and they talk about the extreme memories that they had that were primarily due to the lacks of oxygen in the brain as the blood slows to the brain. So why do so many Christians believe that the dead go straight to heaven or hell? Well, mainly because the church needed money. money, money, money. Must be funny. If the Pope can empty purgatory, why would he not do so out of love rather than for money? My God, who is this Martin Luther? So much grace for so little coin. With this indulgence, I can absolve any sin. I can even save the soul of the man who violates the mother of God herself. It's a rich man's world. Before Christ, the early Israelites believed that the dead were waiting for the promised resurrection. They would say things like they gathered to their fathers or sleeping with their fathers when someone died. And in Jesus' day, we read that the conservative and progressive parties argue between themselves as to whether or not there would be a resurrection. Interesting that today it is the exact opposite belief. Instead of believing that people do not get resurrected, their belief is that they are immediately resurrected and they go straight to heaven or hell. After Jesus ascended to heaven, many rabbis still believed in the unconscious death until the resurrection and a Titian's address to the Greeks and Octavius, a debate between a pagan and a Christian, the Christian takes the side of unconscious death. During the 9th century, due to the Catholic doctrine of the veneration of the saints, by which the church received an income through penance and indulgences to get their dead loved ones into heaven, Byzantine writers convinced the common people that their loved ones needed these things in order to get to heaven faster. The belief that the dead are waiting for the return of Christ was so prevalent that it caused quite a rift in the Catholic Church when Pope John called quite a controversy by stating that the saved do not attain beatific vision or see God until the judgment day. The College of Cardinals even held a consistory on the problem in January of 1334. The controversy lasted so long that Pope Benedict issued a papal bull, Benedictus Dios. This document made it a de facto doctrine that after death, the dead go immediately to heaven. After all, it's very lucrative for the church and losing this income would be a disastrous for the business. A reformer was even burned at the stake by the Catholic Church for preaching this from their Bible. The belief that the dead are truly dead continued into the Reformation against the Catholic Church with William Tyndale, who argued against Thomas More in favor of soul sleep. Many Anabaptists in this period, like Michael Sattler, believed the dead are dead. However, the best known advocate of morality was none other than Martin Luther. 
scripture everywhere affords such consolation which speaks of the death of the saints as if they fell asleep and were gathered to their fathers and awaited the resurrection together with the saints who preceded them in death. Thus, after death, the soul goes to its bedchamber and to its peace, and while sleeping, it does not realize its sleep. It is probable, in my opinion, that with very few exceptions indeed, the dead sleep in the utter insensibility till the day of judgment. Throughout the 16th and 19th century, many Christians believed in this mortalism, that the dead are truly dead. So what does the Bible say about this belief? Well, the Bible reveals that this belief was created by the devil himself when he told Eve at the tree of knowledge of good and evil that you will not surely die. But isn't this talking about the body only? What about the soul of the person? Well, Ezekiel 18.4 says, The soul who sins shall die. And Matthew 10.28 says, Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So these fascinating verses tell us that the soul does die. It doesn't live on forever. Now, some are going to say, well, that's only for the sinners. The righteous go right to heaven. Not necessarily. Check this verse out. 1 Thessalonians 14 through 18 says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive remain until the coming of the Lord, when by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself would descend with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we should be with the Lord forever. Fascinating. The dead in Christ will rise first. So in other words, if you're dead and you are in Christ, meaning you're righteous, you will rise first if you're dead. So where do you people get the idea that you get this ethereal spirit that comes out of your body? Well, it's not from the Bible. Genesis 2-7 says, you are that soul. Let's read it together. And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. King James Version says, he became a living soul. God did not put a soul into him he became a soul after two things happened, the dust of the ground and the breath of life. And nowhere in the Bible does it speak of the breath having a conscience. It's not alive. The best way to think about it is a light bulb. What creates the light? Well, it's electricity going through the light bulb to create light. What creates life? Well, it's God's breath coming through our dust, our body, that creates life. Without the breath, there is no life. And the body returns to the earth. Breath and spirit are synonymous in the Bible. They use the word ruach, which is spirit or breath. Because if you believe that the soul lives in a person, then you have to believe that it lives in the nostrils. Because according to Genesis 2-7, he breathed into his nostrils. And Job 27.3 says, And long as my breath is in me, and the breath of God is in my nostrils. So if someone believes that there is a soul in a person, ask them if they believe it lives in the nostrils. A fascinating study of the Bible shows once again, Satan has masterfully changed the definition of words to mean something that they do not. The Bible teaches that upon death, we do not believe as the new age believers do, or they, as the UFOlogists do. There are people who claim that they can connect with different extraterrestrial beings, speak light language. Yeah. She claimed to speak alien language. I felt like this grandfather cosmic energy. Well, there's been lots, upon us. lots going on with my grandfather. And is he still on Earth or? No, he died. Well, he's definitely one of your guides. Guides, 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 guides. The Bible guides, teaches guides. that the dead are fully dead. Even the disciples believed this in Jesus' day. They said in John 3.13, 
no one has ascended into the heaven except he who has come down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. And in Acts 2, 29 through 34, it says, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you about the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us today. For David did not ascend into the heavens. In other words, King David, everyone revered today and back then, is not in heaven. He's righteous, but he's not there. So he has to be asleep. Phil is a medium and life guide who says he communicates with souls who cross over to the other side. Welcome to the show, Phil. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, I grew up in Northern Ireland. I'm the youngest of seven boys, and my grandmother had passed away, and I had seen her in my bedroom, standing there, very full, very lifelike. And she says, Philip, you have a gift. You have to use it as best you possibly can, and you won't understand what it means right now, and proceeded to leave, and that's when it began. And, and do you think loved ones are always with us? Always, except when you go to the bathroom. After knowing what you know now about what the Bible says about death, the logic is easy to see. God would never send his grandmother back to her grandson to tell him to be a medium when he doesn't like mediums. Besides, who wants their grandmother or grandfather, whoever died, in the bathroom with them, watching over them? On top of that, it is well known that these psychics are playing with spiritualism, not dead loved ones because it sometimes causes demonic oppression. Weird stuff can happen sometimes. <laughs> so sitting across the table from this client, basically a demon face comes at me, and I actually had to ask this client to leave and give them a refund. The wisest man ever to speak in the Bible says this, the dead do not know anything, in Ecclesiastes 9, 5 through 10. And probably one of the first books ever written in the Bible is Job. And Job says, darkness is my grave. The man that lies down and dies does not rise. Isaiah, a prophet, says, the dead do not praise God. And Job reiterates that the dead do not return to their home, as we already learned. And John the Apostle says, death means sleep. And one of the many Psalms that we have says, there is no giving thanks to God in the grave. And continues to say, that the dead are silent and not praising the Lord. These are just a few of the many, many verses in the Bible that go on to continually say that the dead are truly dead. Now granted, there are some strange verses in the Bible that you can probably pull some strange ideas from. Let's go over those. Here are five of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible about death. Number one, the thief on the cross. Didn't Jesus offer the thief on the cross immediate access to heaven? What's really fascinating is that Jesus himself said that he never went to heaven when he rose from the grave. In John 20, 17, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, he told Mary. So what does Jesus mean? The actual statement of Jesus to the thief was this, Verily I say unto thee, Today you shall be with me in paradise. But in the original language, there was not any commas. So the authors inserted a comma directly. It should read, Verily I say unto you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Number two, the rich man and Lazarus. There is a parable of the rich man and Lazarus in which the rich man is in hell and Lazarus is in heaven. If taken literally, this story proves that the souls have eyes and tongues the dead souls are in heaven, and a drop of water can cool a tongue burning in hell. And heaven and hell are fairly close to each other because the reception is great. The truth is that the Bible tells us that the reason this story was told was because the Pharisees were covetous. Christ drove them home with a lesson in saying that wealth doesn't get them into heaven. Number three, souls under the altar. The story of the rich man and Lazarus is similar to the symbolism found in Revelation 6, 9, and 10. Taken literally, this passage proves to us that the dead souls of the most worthy martyrs are not happy as they are confined to a place under God's altar and in terrible distress. Doesn't sound like a very pleasant reward for the faithful. Instead, I think this is symbolic poetry of Revelation's beasts and monsters are playing out a parable like what God said to Cain, the voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. We don't believe that the blood of 
Abel had vocal cords to speak with. Number four, absent from the body. In 2 Corinthians 5.8, Paul says he is willing to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. It's easy to assume that he is talking about death, but since this all happens in verse 8, check the context. In verse 1 and 2, he speaks of how our earthly house is being dissolved, and in verse 4, mortality being swallowed up so that there is no more death. Paul is referring to the second coming when he says, I will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. He wouldn't contradict himself, for in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, he says, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It is at this point that we are all changed from being absent from the mortal body and being present with the Lord. Number five, out of the body. Another confusing text is 2 Corinthians 12, 2 and 3. As some believe, this means that your body and your soul were separate. But in verse 1, he introduces the subject that he's talking about, visions and revelations from the Lord. In the same way, Colossians 2, 5 says, though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit. Just as if we would say, I can't be there, but I will be with you in spirit. We don't actually believe that our soul leaves us to be with them, but the memory of us is with them. This is not all the verses that are confusing, but it is the most popular ones that are brought up. If you want to continue this conversation, leave me a comment below and I'll answer your questions about death. From the Bible, the truth is that death is the absence of life. Death is the worst thing that has ever happened to this whole universe. What the devil wants you to think otherwise is that you shall not surely die. Your eyes will be opened and you will become like God. If we choose to believe that death brings this kind of privilege, we are following the devil's theology, New Age theology, and UFOlogy. In this video, you learn that UFOlogists and New Agers promote duality of the soul as one of their most praised tenets of faith. Number two, what you believe about death will open the door to spiritual deception. Just like in the Bible times, it'll happen in the last days of Earth's history. Number three, mediums and necromancers were an offense to God and were forbidden in the Bible because they produced deceptions from the dead. And the lies of demons were followed and even worshiped. Number four, today the problem still exists, but even the mediums today admit of demonic oppressions. Number five, belief in the dead being still alive in a higher state of consciousness will lead to following what they say in place of God, which is called the greatest Christian deception of this age. Number six, Hollywood's propaganda is always teaching the laws of Satan, and it is producing this propaganda that consistently teaches the immortality of the soul. Number seven, the Satanic Bible also teaches that the soul is immortal, just like the snake told Eve in the first book of the Bible called Genesis. Number eight, the emotional stories about heavenly tourism are so inconsistent that none of them can be believed. In fact, some have even come forward to say that they were lying. Number nine, one of Martin Luther's 99 theses was that the church was in error on a state of the dead and began to help the church's finances as the Catholic church began to ask people to pay to help get their family members into heaven faster. After the Protestant movement, the majority of Christianity believed that the dead were truly dead. Number 10, the Bible teaches that the dead are truly dead. I think it's clear that the dead are truly dead, but in the off chance that I am wrong, I will simply be corrected when I get to heaven. However, if I believe that the dead are floating around up there somewhere, I could lose my salvation by the deceptive practices of the devil. If you got nothing else from this video, know this. If a person, regardless of how real they look, feel, or smell, 
their mannerisms, their laugh, their smile, or knowledge, God forbid you to speak with them. So it can't be someone that you know, sent by God to do something that he forbid. Ultimately, the only conclusion that is logical is that this is a demonic representation. Hey, where you going? This has been a sample expose for Little Eye Studios from my YouTube channel called Strange Normal. For more content that's going to dive into the stranger things that's going to be an even bigger part of your normal life in the near future, from a biblical perspective, subscribe to my channel on YouTube or go to strangenormal.org to view more content like this one. Thanks for watching.